thank you all for coming out, especially on what I hope is the last cold night of the winter. Please, <laughs> I'm done. I'm done. Um, I'm Andy. I'm one of the booksellers here at the Norwich Bookstore. And a couple housekeeping things. Please turn off your phones. Also, we have plenty of books if you would like to purchase one. That would be great. <laughs> We are here tonight with Carolyn Matthews Doubt. I love that last name. Volume? Yes. Here, I'll just move closer because that's actually the key, but I'm very, like a magnetic <laughs> mover, so sometimes it's hard to focus. Um, yeah, Doubt is like the best last name for a creative. That's really fantastic. I know it's probably not your fault, but I love it. Uh, Carolyn Matthews Doubt is an accomplished interior designer who discovered her passion for watercolor painting while studying at the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point. Ashley went there, too. I don't know yes. if you guys know. Okay. Uh, since then, she has taken her sketchbook and watercolor set with her wherever she goes. Carolyn's love of travel and adventure has taken her around the world, from the rolling farmlands of Wisconsin to the rugged mountains of New Zealand, the picturesque islands of Bar Harbor, the bustling streets of London, and the majestic canyons of Utah. Today, she lives in Lebanon, <laughs> New Hampshire. <laughs> but she has a puppy, so, you know, worth it. Uh, this book is a combination of vivid sketches and engaging storytelling. Paint, Sweat and Tears, 150 Days on the Appalachian Trail describes the full range of experience that epitomize long distance hiking. Through rainy shelters, sweeping views, food, flowers, and towns along the way, this book captures both the extraordinary and mundane aspects of the Appalachian Trail. More than just a travelogue, this intimate portrait of Carolyn's journey tells a story of self-discovery and perseverance through the physical and mental challenges of a five-month backpacking adventure. Through it all, the author's artistic talents shine in her beautifully rendered sketches, which bring to life the stunning landscapes and unique characters she encounters along the way. Please join me in welcoming Carolyn. Thank you so much. Oh, well, hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? The mic, we're good? Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you to all of you for coming out here, spending some time with me to talk about art and the Appalachian Trail and what it was like kind of creating this book, also hiking the trail. So my presentation is kind of a mix of a lot of different things, so it should have something for our hiking enthusiasts, our artistic folks, and people who just love the trail or love New England or love being outside. So what I'll do is kind of kick things off just reading the introduction to my book, and then I have a bunch of other information about gear and, you know, different other aspects of the hike, and then We'll have some time at the end for questions and things but if at any point you want to interject with a, with a question or a comment or what have you just raise your hand and I'll come we can circle around to it <clears throat> I have been hearing tales of my mom and her glory days hiking in the white mountains of New Hampshire since before I could hike myself. Her passion for the outdoors ensured that my first memories were of woods and rivers and that hiking and backpacking were a constant part of my childhood. Her love for the wilderness eventually became my love for the wilderness, but this wasn't love at first sight. For me, this starts with a story of myself as a willful child. When I was six, my family lived in a suburban town on the Chesapeake Bay. During that mild mid-Atlantic winter, I yearned for snowfall as I had seen in Maine and New Hampshire on visits to my grandparents. When it finally started to snow, I felt like it was snowing just for me. I watched it accumulate on the classroom windows all day, on the edge of my seat, staring at the clock. As soon as I got home, I ran outside with a goal in mind. I wanted to build my own snowman. Hours later, I was uncontrollably shivering with blue lips and every article of clothing soaking wet. So much effort, but still my snowman wasn't complete. <laughs> Although I can understand it now, when my mom forced me to come inside, it felt like the greatest injustice of my young life. Through my sobs, I told her that she'd caused me to forever lose what I called my adventurous spirit. <laughs> From that point on, I would stubbornly decline trips outside, citing the loss of that adventurous spirit in the snow. One of my mom's favorite stories <laughs> when I was a child. <laughs> Years later, we took a family trip to Shenandoah National Park. I watched South River Falls cascade over rocks into a deep green pool, transfixed yet again by the power of nature. 
I walked up to my mom and happily exclaimed that it was back. My adventurous spirit had been found. <laughs> to this day, I don't understand what it was that I found in that Virginia waterfall. And at the outset of all of my adventures since then, I feel something that I identify as the spirit. It's a mix of fear and excitement, wonder and trepidation. It's a feeling I have right before jumping into a freezing mountain lake of leaping into the beautiful unknown. After moving back to New Hampshire, we took several family backpacking trips through the White Mountains. I learned what to pack and how to set up camp, where to look for alpine plants, and when to call it quits in bad weather. I still didn't know why I hiked. Was this something I did just because of my family? Could it become something that I do for myself? When I was 19, I decided to find out by following my mom's footsteps and taking a summer job with the Appalachian Mountain Club. Instead of working in the mountain huts like she had, I spent that summer working at the Pinkham Notch Visitor Center at the base of Mount Washington. Spending that summer exploring the White Mountains changed me. It allowed me to feel the self-reliance, confidence, and ease I always thought that I lacked. The Appalachian Trail passes by the front door of the lodge at Pinkham, and while working there, I saw a lot of through hikers. I was in awe of them. They had the strength and the skill to make it that far north, and I never forgot how I felt seeing those people 1,800 miles into the trail, taking time on a sunny front porch to simply enjoy the afternoon ready for long days ahead. That was the moment I started thinking about doing the same. As an adult, I chased adventure through the farmlands of Wisconsin, and the mountains of New Zealand, and the islands of Bar Harbor, the streets of London, and the canyons of Utah. My next great adventure always felt like it was just around the corner. But then, with the first whispers of COVID-19, I saw my plans for the future evaporate. A planned year-long cross-country road trip with my husband was two months away when the world shut down. I'd even told my employer that I would be leaving, and suddenly I was backpedaling and then living in suspended time, not moving forward or back. The next year and a half were defined by the isolation of working from home and the horror of hospital conditions, fear, anger, stress, grief for those lost and opportunities set aside. My husband was working as an ICU nurse, so the terrible reality of this virus was never on the periphery of our lives. I would wait for him to come home, worried about exposure, more worried about the things he might have seen. These anxieties were brought to even greater heights when he took a temporary job in New York City to help with the understaffed ICUs and too many COVID patients. It was hell on earth, and in the end, it changed both of us. Back in our Utah home, we both battled with anxiety and depression and each other. Cracks in the foundation of our marriage that seemed harmless were now causing my life to crumble around me. And I was left with a sense that I didn't know myself or what I wanted out of my life at all. And through therapy and empathy and love for each other, we started to fit our lives back together. All of the stress and pain and love culminated in a golden ticket. My husband got an offer for his dream job out of the ICU, but unfortunately also out of our beloved Utah home. With this, the choice was made to move back to New England after seven years away. After the move, I endured a lonely season. It was a remote work in the dead of a New Hampshire winter, away from my circle of friends, and it felt impossible at times. I was continuously dragged under the stormy waters of my own mind, but I also started to be bolstered by a wild idea that maybe now is the time to attempt an Appalachian Trail through hike. I wanna say I did not decide to hike this trail to find myself or to seek out the secret to a happy life. I decided to hike the trail because I needed to know that I could have big dreams and that my life still held the capacity for my dreams to become reality. I wanted to become one of those hikers I saw a decade earlier at Pinkham Notch. I coveted their grit and freedom and strength. More than anything, I wanted to accomplish something extraordinary in a time where my own anxiety and depression were constantly trying to convince me that I was not good enough. Despite my doubts, I took a step, and then another, and then another. It took me 148 days to cover the 2,193.1 miles of the Appalachian Trail. With my life on my back, I walked in snow flurries, hurricanes, sleet, and sun. I walked over mountains and through valleys. I walked until I bled, until I laughed, until I cried. 
I walked my way out of the deepest depression of my life, and I found, once again, that I possess an adventurous spirit which, when lost, can only be found again in the wild places of this world. <laughs> That's always a very emotional read for me, as you can probably tell. I mean, if you flip through the book or perhaps own a copy already, you'll see and know that most of the big bulky text components are really just at the beginning, introduction kind of at the end, and the rest of it is kind of interspersed with these smaller stories kind of throughout the entire book. But in that intro, that every time it's, I have to kind of work myself up to reading it because I think it also just gives really good insight into what my motivations were and where, where I started in my family history with hiking and with the White Mountains specifically, which I know, you know, is uh, Upper Valley locals. It's, yeah, White Mountains are truly a really special place and a place that I hold very dear to myself. And it was something too that when I started hiking and reaching the White Mountains in particular, that felt like um, a huge moment <laughs> for me of like, you know, feeling like I really made it and I was home and comfortable back in that environment as well. Um, so now we'll get into some of the more fun <laughs> components of through hiking. The first of which is our gear, which is the number one question that I get from people at these events or just if I've you know, been talking about the trail, which is, you know, how heavy was your backpack and what did you pack inside of that backpack and what kind of changed? Um, and so I have inside of the book, there's some great kind of graphics too of what the gear looks like and the full lists of the different components, but I'll kind of run through what my decision making process was throughout all of that as well. Um, so I went in with a 45 liter backpack, which is a little bit smaller than um, ones that I've used backpacking before, but I received an excellent bit of advice from an ex through hiker who'd said that if you have a bigger backpack, you will fill that backpack <laughs> with stuff over time. And so if you really want to kind of help yourself keep your weight down to just have a smaller pack to begin with, because there's only so heavy that you can make a smaller pack. Um, and my whole goal was to fully packed with all of my food and water and everything would be to be in that kind of 25 to 30 pound range, which means I was really shooting for a target of around 15 pounds for all of my gear, my whole backpack, let's be say minus food, fuel, and water. It's all those little pieces that kind of come and go that make, you know, on a resupply day, it's much heavier. It's so much more stuff inside of your backpack. And then over the course of, you know, the week that you're hiking before your next resupply, that's when, you know, your backpack gets lighter and lighter. Maybe it's back down to that, you know, 15 to 17 pounds. And then you resupply and get back on the trail. And it's like, oh my gosh, this thing is back to, you know, 25 pounds almost. <laughs> so it's definitely something. Um, that has a lot of fluctuation. But for me, that was my goal, was to hit that 15 pound backpack rate, which I almost did going into it. And then I paired off a lot of things over the, maybe the first month or so is when I figured out really what I didn't need, really what, what I did need. So a couple of the things that I added was number one, a pillow. <laughs> because at the beginning I thought I would just put dirty clothes into a stuff sack and like use that as a pillow, which seems like a good idea. Um, seems like a good idea. For, for me, it was not. It was terrible and I was just so uncomfortable and like, I already had stiff shoulders and it was, you know, maybe a week before passing through a resupply. I just picked up a little inflatable pillow. Um, and then the other addition that I made was to transition to a full-size sleeping pad. This was another kind of weight consideration that I had where I bought a like kind of kids inflatable sleeping pad it was maybe 40 inches long because my thought was okay if it's under my shoulders and my hips that should be okay and we won't have to worry about it that was um, another kind of miscalculation on my part where my feet were so sore that after again a couple weeks having my feet on like the hard cold ground all night was um, was not going to work and <laughs> ended up um, swiping my mom's uh, sleeping pad from her after she came out and hiked with me <laughs> for a few days. <laughs> um, and then I removed a few things. I removed, I was carrying paper maps as a backup. I'm definitely an analog person. I'm not 
typically totally digital. Something about having a hard copy map for me was very comforting and something that I really wanted to have. But, you know, about halfway through, I was never referencing them at all. So I still carried a couple just in case, but I, I never I never referenced them. I just used um, the apps that are out there now for tracking, tracking mileage for better or worse. You know, it's a great system and there was always enough spots to charge a phone that it wasn't something that I ended up being terribly worried about because I was thinking that all the time my phone would be dead and I'd have to be trying to find my way somewhere, but that just ended up not being the case. Um, There's lots of, lots of little access points. Um, I also ended up getting rid of my rain pants. This was another, another thing which I kind of thought would would go away, um, but also as a New England hiker, someone who grew up in the White Mountains is drilled into my brain by my mom of, you know, always have rain pants and rain jacket anytime you're you're hiking, especially in the White Mountains. And so I definitely, I went into it carrying those rain pants and it was again, maybe a month and a half before those were shipped, shipped back home. <laughs> um, and then I carried essentially one pair of clothes for hiking and one pair of clothes for end of the night at the campsite. And that is all that I carried with me for actual changes of clothes. And I had a puffy jacket and had a layer, you know, pants and a couple pairs of socks. But the kind of base outfit was one that um, was reworn every single day and then washed at hostels whenever we could, or like in towns, you could stop and get a beer and maybe do your laundry at the same time. Um, but those clothes were definitely um, trashed by the end. They were essentially disintegrating by the time I was finished with the hike, but it's something where um, I feel like I could never really go back even maybe to the rain pants situation or even long hiking pants. I mean, by the end, I was wearing shorts and a long sleeve every day, you know, into even November, even when it was rainy or slightly snowy, it's just kind of got to this point where this is what I knew would work for me and just kind of ran with it. But, was it, was it yeah. hard? to let go of them? Yes. <laughs> I think they have a lot of um, sentimental connection for you. Yes, no, it definitely was. I still have one one of the shirts that I wore while I was hiking. I still I still hold on to that and I'll like pull it out every now and then and my husband will be like, you cannot wear that in public <laughs> because it still has, you know, it's like you wear clothes for so long they just develop like you'll never get them to smell truly <laughs> nice again. <laughs> but yeah, no, I couldn't, can't bear to let go of every, every piece of that clothing either. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, I had my art kit because, as we know, you know, part of what my whole adventure was was this art component of it. And so, I would encourage after this um, talk up at the front here, I have my uh, watercolor set, which is the actual one that I brought hiking with me. And then I did bring the actual books, the actual sketchbooks that I carried with me as well. And essentially, this is what I'll pull it up. This is what it looks like. <laughs> this is like the, the original one. So this is the one that I carried with me. Essentially what I did is I took this sketchbook because I make, I make my own, I make my own sketchbooks because I like them to lay flat in a very particular way. And so I took this and broke it up into a bunch of smaller sections. So they were all bound together with the same hard cover for protection. And then once the whole hike was over, I took all of the binding out and then rebound it together. So it's like one big chunk like this. But when I was hiking, it was broken out into like almost four kind of smaller sketchbooks that then had to be put back together. Um, but this is something where, you know, wanting it the smaller size so that I could fit it in my backpack, it was in like a Ziploc bag, then inside of a waterproof bag, and then inside of my contractor bag, which is where, you know, my sleeping bag and the rest of my clothes were inside of my backpack. So it was definitely a constant worry and constant um, something that was always on my mind of making sure that this book was going to be dry and that it wasn't going to get damaged or I wasn't going to leave it on, on a rock somewhere and, you know, walk off, walk off without it as well. Um, and it was something too where it has stayed remarkably clean and put together. <laughs> um, it's still like all the pages are still very bright. So I definitely think my um, kind of insistence on keeping it nice and clean really paid off for me <laughs> in, in the long haul because it definitely, definitely still is like kind of maintaining, maintaining all of that. 
Um, okay, so now we have our bag packed and we'll be setting out on the trail. So I'll walk you through kind of what the typical day in the life of a through hiker looked like for me at least. So you wake up at first light. For me, it was always as soon as the sun was up, that was when I woke up and didn't, didn't really need an alarm most of the time unless I had a really hard day the night before. And then I would always be wanting to, you know, get that, get that alarm set just, just in case. Um, but it was most often, so as soon as the sun started to come up, you know, you're awake, other through hikers wake up at the same time. So you can always hear people kind of shuffling around, especially the shelters or campsites in the morning. Um, I would always do a pretty simple breakfast at camp, um, which is a essentially the biggest protein bar that I could handle eating in the morning with my little instant coffee or hot chocolate, um, which I kind of cycled through a bunch of different types of protein bars because I would eat the same kind, whatever I could kind of stomach for maybe a few weeks and then be like, I cannot eat another pro bar and then be like, oh, I can't eat, you know, another cliff bar. And so it just ended up being something where I just kind of cycled through a lot of these different kind of as many calories as possible, like really dense, chewy bar, which still to this day, you can probably tell, gives me a little bit of like, well, I can't. <laughs> it's, um, it, was, uh, it was tough to, <laughs> tough to, tough to live like that for a while. But the combination of the hot chocolate and instant coffee was um, a lifesaver over and over again. <laughs> um, in the breakfast and kind of morning time at camp as well is when I would check weather conditions. And when I would use, like I mentioned, this app that it's called Far Out. Uh, which is essentially a mapping and location app specifically for long distance trails. Um, so it essentially locates you along the trail and then you can look at points ahead. It'll tell you, you know, how far to a certain point, how much elevation gain and loss, where maybe your water access points will be or your shelter access points will be. So it's this extremely beefy um, program that is invaluable and was something where every morning, you know, I'd essentially plan my day every morning, um, look at the map, be like, okay, you know, what does a 15 to 20 mile day look like? Is there a shelter towards one side or the other side of that? So it was something where um, at the beginning, I had like, every single shelter picked out everywhere I was going to stay for weeks and weeks. And within the first couple days, it just got totally shot and so kind of changed to being this kind of day by day um, way of going about it, where it's definitely like waking up in the morning and then having the goal, maybe a general goal with the people that you're hiking with of how long out you might want to be, um, you know, that night. But it was definitely turned into something where that was just part of my morning routine. Um, and then first half of the day, I would typically try to walk six to 12 miles to get the bulk of my mileage out of the way in the morning. Um, always goes faster, feels like it goes faster in the morning time. Um, and so definitely for me, I would always try to get at least, at least maybe 50 to 60% of my total mileage out before lunchtime. Um, as it just seemed like as soon as you have your lunch and you're in the afternoon, those miles take twice as long. And then the last mile of the day will always feel like it takes an hour to hike a single mile where in the morning, you know, you'll be like, oh, how I've already walked five miles and didn't even notice it. At the end of the day, you'll be like, I cannot believe it's taking me this long to walk a quarter mile up a spur trail to access this, you know, shelter or tent site. Um, Typically for lunch, I would always be searching for a tent or a shelter site um, simply because there are picnic tables most of the time at tent and shelter sites, which after a while, um, when I had been hiking so long, I was starting to have some kind of foot and joint pain. The thought of um, crouching on a rock to, you know, eat my little um, tuna wrap versus sitting at a nice picnic table at a shelter site was always something that was worth, worth pushing that lunch hour, you know, even way far of noon from one side or the other, if it could guarantee that you're going to be a little bit more, a little bit more comfortable. Um, and then part of my morning routine also would be integrating the sketching component into my day. Like we said, it's definitely something where I had to, I had to plan and make sure that I was setting the time aside to do the sketching and artwork specifically, because I really wanted to do it every day or almost every day. Um, and I succeeded that there was maybe one or two days where I maybe missed, you know, that exact day in the sketchbook, but um, wanting to make sure that it was, I was in a good enough kind of mental and physical state to be able to do something creative, which is 
extremely difficult when you're also trying to do this other extremely physical feat, which for me, a lot of the time, it would be at the end of the day and finally be at camp and just be like, all I want to do right now is just lay inside of my tent and like elevate my feet, just not do anything at all. And so it had to be at times a very intentional practice for me of, of saying either like, okay, it's gonna be a really long day. Maybe I should take more time in the morning and do a sketch or do a sketch at lunchtime, knowing that maybe at the end of the day, I will be exhausted and really, really pushing myself. And so it was something that, um, that also nobody else um, that I was hiking with, my friends, my little tramily at times, they were always very accepting of it. You know, it'd be like, okay, I'm gonna do a sketch. I'll catch up with you guys in you know, five or six hours at camp. Um, and because we'd always kind of you'd get spaced out over the course of the day, especially if one of your people is taking these kind of odd breaks. But it was something where we always just kind of picked our end destination. And so if there was people that I really wanted to continue hiking with, we could always make that happen, even though we weren't hiking together, you know, every second of the day. Um, and then I also would do um, a lot of other kind of um, joint and stretching care because again, you know, of course, major athletic kind of moment. And so for me, the prep that I did going into the AT was not any kind of like stair machine or really that much hiking or backpacking to prepare. Because for me, I knew that all of the conditioning for a hike like this would happen as soon as I was, you know, on that trail and I was really going and doing it every day. Because I think the only way to kind of be in shape for doing something like this is to hike 15 to 20 miles a day every day and then hope that, <laughs> wait for your body to kind of acclimate or not. And so for me, that's kind of where I was going into it as saying like, you know, I'm not going to be really strong right off the bat. Um, and I, before this hike, never really saw myself as a particularly strong hiker either. Like, you know, I'd never done a very long backpacking trip. Max before this was maybe three or four days. And so it was this whole reset for me. It's a whole new adventure. <laughs> and I was mostly worried about injuring myself. And so the kind of preparation that I did was a lot of ankle and knee exercises, not for strength, but for mobility. So more thinking, you know, not how do I prevent myself from rolling an ankle? But when I inevitably do roll my ankle, how do you, you know, keep that from being a, a hike ending? <laughs> accident because that happens it's very common is that you'll you know, especially in the early weeks of a through hike through hikers will just roll your ankle slightly wrong and and that'll that'll do it and they'll push you out until the next year especially if you don't have enough of the background strength kind of built up yet so for me that was something i was really focused on yeah did you use walking sticks at all i did yes yeah two yep yeah. And that was something that I'd never done before, um, but was very, very strongly recommended to me. <laughs> yes, and I now very strongly recommend that to everybody else as well. I mean, because it's especially it's for balance, but for me, I feel like having my trekking poles um, saved me from other more major accidents of falling. There were so many times where I'd start to twist my ankle or start to fall and be able to plant my trekking poles and kind of save myself from that so it was definitely a really nice safety net although um, one of my maybe worst falls on the entire hike was one where this exact situation happened where i started to roll my ankle planted my trekking pole and my pole snapped in half oh, wow. um, and i just went straight straight over it was like a slow motion you know like falling forward and i had this moment as i was falling of like i think i'm about to hit my head on this like very rocky terrain i was just going over i was like i think i'm gonna hit my head i think i'm gonna hit my head and i did but it was just it was very minor everything was fine. everything was fine but that was um one of my more terrifying moments Where and then the um so they were gossamer gear uh like an extremely lightweight carbon fiber pole because i was going for going for for minimal weight on those um and then i and it did snap a second time as well i got a replacement part and it snapped again so i definitely um have traded in those very lightweight carbon fiber for more ones that are a little bit heavier but won't you know, won't break like that because it was, it was a complete, yeah, there was no, no saving, no saving those poles at all. Um, so a couple of 
give you a couple of, I call them kind of tales from the trail of what, <laughs> kind of these funny incidents that happen along the way. Um, my favorite one was my in my very first week of hiking. I was in West Virginia. So again, I go over this in the book a little bit, but I'll give a little bit of background too for the type of hike that I did, which is called a flip-flop through hike. And so what that means is that I started in West Virginia, which is kind of the unofficial midpoint of the trail, Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. So I started there and I hiked north to Katahdin and then drove back down to West Virginia and then went south to um, Georgia from there. So it was kind of this split, um, split hike where I knew uh, I wanted to have not as much of a crowded trail as a traditional Nobo attempt, especially considering when I was doing this hike, which was in 2021 when vaccines were just coming out and it was all kind of a whole fresh new world of how much exposure and you know everything like that. So that was something that I was considering when I did this flip-flop is to choose something that is less populated where the campsites aren't overflowing like you do see with the traditional northbound attempt these days because it is definitely a popular, a popular popular trail and it's just growing and more and more people interested in hiking, which means that these, you know, days, especially this time of year, March and April, is when the majority of hikers are starting in Georgia, that you could be starting with 50 to 60 people on the same day as you and then heading to these campsites because everybody, you know, is doing that same kind of mileage and maybe the 8 to 15 mile range. And so you end up with these campsites that are really overpopulated for weeks and weeks, um, depending on what time you go or you deal with worse weather. <laughs> and then, But for me, it was something where I really was attracted by the idea of doing this split so that I could have the White Mountains in the summer and not be in this time crunch either to hit Katahdin and then be able to do the southern states in fall. It was October and September when I was hiking through, you know, Virginia, for example, which was something that that made it worth it by itself because it was so beautiful and, and really surprised me too of how beautiful the southern states were. Like I said, always so focused on New Hampshire, but there's some real gems down there. Um, so it was my kind of first first week. So I was in maybe Maryland heading north and it was um, actually ended up being the coldest night that I had on trail the entire trip within that very first week. It was um, maybe got down to the single digits at night. Um, it was something where I knew it would be testing my sleep system. It would be testing the clothes that I was bringing, kind of every part of it. it ended up being an extremely, extremely cold night. Did not sleep that well, you know, we made it through, but it was definitely a night um, that was that was very, very chilly. And it must have been around midnight where we heard some kind of commotion, some other hiker coming into the shelter and tent site in the middle of the night, which is pretty common. You'll you'll find that because it's, of course, open access. So there's no, you know, curfew for people coming into camp. So through hikers, you know, they're in there very early and, and, and in bed too, probably by like eight every night. And so if people are coming in later, either they're pulling these really long days or they're kind of day hikers are coming in for some other reason. So somebody came into this site in the middle of the night and the next morning on the bear pole, which is of course the big metal pole that you use to hang your food to protect it from the bears from getting to it, um, this new arrival at camp had brought a full box of pizza um, and had taken a massive hunting knife of some kind. It was maybe like 10 inches long and stabbed it through the pizza box and then put the loop of the knife over the bear pole to like elevate this pizza box off the ground so the bear couldn't get to it. And so we all woke up and looked at how at this bear pole in the morning, We're like what the heck is happening here? It's just like never seen anything like it. And then the guy woke up as well and he was offering everybody um, frozen slices of pizza after our very cold <laughs> night, which were uh, universally declined because yeah, I wasn't, there's no way you were going to catch me eating that, eating that pizza. Um, the maybe best day that I had on the trail was, uh, was in New Hampshire, um, on the Franconia Ridge, which I'm sure many of you know, very beloved spot up here. And it was one that I was really looking forward to hiking on the AT because I'd never backpacked it. And it was just something just like really looking forward to it and covering so much more distance than I'd ever been able to cover in the White Mountains before. And it ended up being this absolutely beautiful day. Um, 
amid a lot of really rainy and, and kind of crappy days, which happens, which happens a lot on the trail too, is that you'll have day after day where it's raining or the trail conditions are muddy and soupy or it's rocky or there's just, you know, a million different ways that your day could be ruined. <laughs> and then you'll have a day where you wake up and it's warm and the sun is out and it just feels right. It's like, you know, even just the sun being out after a couple rainy days for me, it always felt like a whole fresh lease on life. You know, it felt strong again and felt like my pack wasn't too heavy. And this was definitely one of those days, this Franconia Ridge day. Um, started out really windy and rainy to the point where it kind of huddled down before um, the Lafayette summit, um, hoping that maybe the wind would die down just a little bit because it was like blowing sideways. And I was hiking with some another through hiker I'd met on the trail at that point. And so we were trying to decide what to do. And we're like, okay, we should just keep going. If it gets better, that's great. If not, then at least we'll be, you know, like making forward progress. As we headed up that ridge, it was just the cloud cover started to blow away and the wind was blowing it up and over the ridge in this really interesting way. And then the rest of the day was just blue skies and sunny and just felt like um, Sandy and I were just like sprinting, you know, over those ridges. And just, I've, I've never really felt like that in my life because for me also, I'm somebody who has has, you know, carries a lot of doubt with me and carries a lot of insecurity, especially when it comes to these more active pursuits is because I've always been somebody who is not going to be the fastest person. And even going into this hike, I was always telling myself, like, you don't have to be fast. You just have to keep putting one foot in front of the other. It doesn't matter how long it takes you to do every day as long as you make the effort to try and go and do it. And so that was kind of the mindset that I went into it with. And then by the time I hit that Franconia Ridge day, something something changed in my in my brain my soul maybe it was like suddenly something was unlocked in me where i felt not just that i could do it but that i could be very fast and i could be very strong and that i could do you know, not only do this whole hike, but I could do it in, you know, not and not have it be this kind of monumental effort either like it became something where especially moving along that ridge because I remember it so clearly of just feeling like like everything was was right it was working out the right ways that I was you know done I did what I needed to do to prepare so that I was strong enough and I think it's just kind of meshed together in such a way that I just felt like we were like completely flying over those mountains ended up staying at geo campsite um, which is an absolutely beautiful spot in the White Mountains too would uh, highly recommend it and that was you know at night the the big thunderstorms that we were experiencing in the morning came back came back through just in time for us to like you know dive back into our tents but even that was this kind of amazing experience up there you know so high and so exposed on the side of that hill and just felt like we were inside of this thunderstorm with no um, kind of no escape it was a little scary at times but the kind of scary that you it kind of makes you excited for more you know it was like we we're all like laughing in our tents of like could you believe this like thunderclap that just happened and it was just something um, kind of an experience in a day especially that will kind of stick in my mind probably forever I don't think I'll ever really forget that um, which is a lot a lot of this Appalachian Trail adventure for me which of course it is a kind of monumental thing and something that was so out of my comfort zone and something I'm so proud of um, both being able to do it and like I mentioned this kind of art aspect of it as well because keeping these sketchbooks is something that I've done for about a decade just in my own day-to-day -day life it's always the same kind of format that's inside of the book but of course for the last 10 years it was more you know coffee shops and bars and, you know, things like that. Um, and so it was kind of an interesting shift to take that same concept and say, okay, I really want to do this in this very different environment, kind of push myself to see if I can create more and create in these kind of uncomfortable conditions. And for me, it started out as a very personal thing. I was creating these watercolors and these sketches for myself of saying, I want my own personal record of this um, because also painting for me especially this plain air in situ when you're out there in the environment um, something about that for me 
just makes things click a little bit more, makes things a little bit more memorable for me. It makes me e easier to recall. Sometimes if I've done a sketch in a place, I can I can remember, you know, the way that it smelled or what the what the weather was like or what all these kind of minute details that if I'm not sitting sitting inside of that space and really sketching it, those details just get kind of lost for me at least. And so it was something where going into this hike, I was I wanted to preserve as much of that as possible. And and then over time, as I was hiking and sharing this with other hikers, because um, of course, lots of through hikers and anytime they'd see me, you know, a little notebook was always like, you know, what is that? What is that? Um, and so it was something where, you know, gaining this confidence for the physical aspect kind of was happening at the same time as gaining confidence for my artwork and for what I do, which has always been this very personal thing that's I do it for myself and has morphed into something where all these through hikers are saying, like, I want I want a copy of that. I want like shows this experience in a different way. And I started to um, start to think about myself in the same way, too, of saying, you know, like I do. This is something that's worth sharing. And I think something like the Appalachian Trail, which is so accessible in little parts and so inaccessible at the same time, um, it felt like an important thing for me to want to preserve and to share as well, to share what it is, what maybe it really does feel like to do something like a long distance through hike where you're really hiking for five months and not doing anything else. And so kind of see this book and the artwork that I created as just a tiny little window into what that experience may be and might help transport you just a little bit, you know, down to the trail and the mountains and the rivers and the valleys. So thank you so much for joining me tonight. <laughs> We'll leave about 15 minutes if anybody has questions or wants to come up and I'll be here so we can chit chat about anything. So first I'll say any questions? What are yes, you sir? doing your book on New Zealand? <laughs> on New Zealand? Oh my gosh, I would love, I would love to. I would like to see your sketchbook on New Zealand. Oh yes, yeah, actually my when I studied abroad in New Zealand, that was the very first sketchbook I did. Oh, it was a, awesome. yes, it was a school assignment from my interior architecture professor saying, keep this watercolor sketchbook, draw the things that you see. And it just captivated me. So that was, that was the very first one was my New Zealand to study abroad one. <laughs> what was yeah. the hardest part and did you ever think about quitting? <laughs> um, yes, I thought about quitting all the time. <laughs> um, no, I mean, the hard, there, was, there was a lot of pretty difficult parts of it. Pennsylvania really sapped me, um, I think because it was early on in the hike, but that's definitely a section that sticks out in my mind as being particularly challenging because it was early, so I wasn't maybe as strong as I was when I was reaching, um, you know, like Vermont, New Hampshire. And of course, what you hear about Pennsylvania is the rocks issue, is the trail is very rocky, which I knew about because it's kind of the rock Sylvania thing is, is something that you hear about when you're contemplating this. And it was no joke. It would, at the end of the day, you know, the bottoms of my feet would just be, be bruised from walking over essentially pointy rocks of the wrong size. They're like this big and loose and it's like, rocks all the way down and so every step that you take it's like your footing is just there's no safe footing and it's really uh, really rocky and, and kind of like jagged everywhere too and there's rattlesnakes so that was delightful um that was definitely definitely one of the most challenging sections for me and I I did I mean there was a lot of times where I was just so, like filled with self-doubt like I don't think I can do this so it never really got to the point where I'm like I'm packing my bag and I'm getting off trail but there would definitely be stretches kind of in the middle where I'd be you know, like wet and cold for three days and be like why am I doing this I just need to get out of here but then the very next day or the one after that would be sunny again and it's like your brain just forget <laughs> any of that misery it would just be like okay it's sunny again let's go just full reset every single time did you see any rattlesnakes? Yes. Yep, I saw probably a six or seven rattlesnakes, maybe. There was quite quite a, a surprising number of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How did you get your trail name? 
Oh yes, my trail name is Hopskip. Um, so my first trail name that was given was in the first few days and that was um, Happy was the one that was initially given to me because I have, um, as you can probably tell, I have this kind of like smiley happy countenance um, and I kept that one for a couple of weeks but there was other happies close to me on the trail, like other through hikers of the same name. And I kept getting confused with them or I'd like meet up because you can kind of track who's around you by the kind of passages written in trail logs that are at different tent sites and shelters and things too. And so, which is interesting because you could be like, oh, this person named Happy is just a couple days ahead of me. So what kept happening is that there's some other Happy who was beloved, <laughs> some beloved Nobo hiker who would, people would catch up and I introduce myself there and be like, oh, we thought that you were this other happy and it's just you instead. <laughs> so, so I ended up, Ditching happy um, in lieu of one. It was going to be Skippy, so it ended up being Hop Skip. Um, we kind of, with my little tramley, we played out a couple different ideas and settled settled on Hop Skip. Yeah, yeah. Do you keep in touch with people you met on the trail? I do, I do. Yeah, there was a couple people um, on going north. I met a guy named Sandy Mike. Sandy was his trail name. And then heading south, I met a woman named Cactus, or Melanie, who I talk about a lot in the book, and then um, Rip, AKA Kevin. And they um, ended up being, the three of us were extremely close. And Cactus and I, in particular, just as soon as we met each other, just clicked. Um, and we have hung out quite a lot. So I feel like a lot of these friendships that I've made, I'm texting you know people every couple of days. We've been meeting up and kind of seeing um, which is amazing. It's people I never would have never would have met otherwise that just um, kind of found their way into my life through this kind of wacky adventure and end up being amazing. What yeah. was your favorite part? Um, I mean, I really like the southern states much more than I expected. Um, like I said, I was really excited for New Hampshire and Maine, but Virginia and Tennessee just blew my mind. It was so beautiful. So if I would go back and maybe redo a section, it would probably be in the Grayson Highlands or Roan Highlands down south. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, n not as much as I want to. I keep this summer is going to be the one where I kind of get back into it because after the hike was done, I my my body was in very bad <laughs> shape. I will say, just depleted, and um, I had a lot of foot problems um, that made it so. By the time I was done with the hike, I really couldn't hike for probably six months after that. And I finished in November, so it's kind of like over the, you know, over the winter. But even now, you know, I have to be careful on extra cold days because I just like have a circulation problem. My feet now just took like maybe too much abuse when I was hiking. So it's just something it's like I have to be a little bit more aware, but it's definitely been more, more local hikes and things. Um, plans to get back out and finish the rest of the long trail. Of course, the AT overlaps with the bottom, maybe half of it approximately. So have some things in the works, but to be honest, that um, hiking has definitely, that was like the high point. Now I'm kind of coming back into it this year. How yeah. did you manage three days of rain with no rain pants? Like I'm trying to wrap my head around the no <laughs> yeah. rain pants thing and being soaked all the time from the legs down. Yep. That might have something to do with your feet. Probably. Right, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's funny. It's the, the rain pants thing. Almost no through hiker carries them. It's very, very rare to see somebody because it's a lot of, for me, it was like the, the annoyance of, of having to put them on was also a deterrent. Of like, oh, it just would be worth it for me to have wet legs than, than to deal with that. And it was much more, you know, like the wetness mitigation was that your clothes are just wet. You know, your hiking clothes every, if it's wet one day, it'll be wet the next day. Sometimes I could dry things out by shoving things inside of my sleeping bag while I was asleep and my body heat would dry things out. But most of the time it would just be like, I'd always be warm at the end of the night because I would always have my dry tent clothes, I called them, because it was like only in the tent, like if I had to get out in the middle of the night to pee or something, I would always, I would take off like my tent clothes because I was always super nervous about them getting wet because, you know, for me, I can hike all day in wet clothes if I know that I can be warm at the end of the day. And so that was, that was the consideration for the rain aspect of it was just, if it's raining, you're going to get a little bit wet <laughs> and your feet will always get wet no matter what. 
What about yeah. gaiters? Did you, did you have gaiters too? I did not. No, I hiked with people who did wear them, but it was more for, yeah, getting the little bits of, you know, pine needles and dirt and rocks and things that get inside of your shoes. But for whatever reason, that was never an issue for me. Yeah. You, you did a great job tonight. Thank you for, for, for your enthusiasm. Oh, well, thank, thank you. Quick <laughs> comment. So yeah. one is about trail angels and the other is about trail art. Yeah. I've made three new friends here. These young people <laughs> up in front and Charlie may be recruited as trail angels. Uh, we have a trail angel system. The archangel Betsy lived right up the road from yes. there. Yes. Would house 500 people a summer. Wow, uh, until amazing. Until recently, she wore out. Can you believe that you would not want to hike? After 500 people a summer in your house for, right. for five, 10 summers. Right. So we're a little short on trail angels now. So I'll be in the back if anybody wants or look in the phone book yes. for Bill Young. I'm, I'm recruiting. Charlie may have been recruited. Yes. Distant hikers. So that's, that's one. The second is is the, uh, well, we do shuttles and homestays, basically. We drive yeah. people all over the country. Nice. Place. The oh, second, nice. second is trail art. Hanover now, maybe it was there, no it wasn't there when you came through, but on the sidewalk in the front of the Parks and Recreation building mm, in Hanover, mm -hmm. there's a wonderful mural on the street painted by Claire and uh, Lauren, two high school students. Uh, we recruited them to paint a mural that says where the going gets tough, Vermont, Maine, New Hampshire, <laughs> New Hampshire, Maine. It's quite fun. Oh, well, that sounds cute. Hopscotch. Hop, skip, and a jump in it. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> those of you in town, go by the Hanover Parks and Recreation. Uh, Hanover and Norwich are trail towns. These you yeah. right on it, mm -hmm. right now. I mean, well, a block away. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Great yeah. job. Tonight. Yeah, so maybe do one more, one more question. Yes. The people who hike the trail, what percent of them start by themselves versus starting in a group? A couple of groups. Um, I think for it seemed like most people were, were by themselves um, for what I saw, especially maybe it was this flip flop aspect because it was a lot more um, retired folks than maybe like college students definitely was geared more towards that like slightly older demographic almost for the flip flop part of it. And that was definitely a lot of just, yeah, single, single people out doing it, um, which was really nice too, because of course, as somebody who my husband had no interest at all in doing this hike, I should mention, he was invited, but he was like, no, thank you. And that was pretty common. I mean, that was, it was also kind of a bonding experience too, like Cactus, this woman I was talking about. She was the exact same situation where her, her husband didn't want to do it, but she was out doing it. And so it was something, too, where you'd find those kind of connections, too, where I was always more drawn to those people. Um, but there was a couple. I saw a couple brothers, you know, who were, like, hiking together or maybe a couple that were hiking together. Um, Pacer and Chaser, they were, like, this married couple that we hiked with for a while. <laughs> and they were great. But that would be, it would be more of, like, these little duos or single, single people, but not often, like, groups of people. So, yeah. Okay. Last one in the back. Orange hat. When you were sketching, were you doing that with the intent of, of making this book, or was it more for yourself? It was more for myself. Yeah, it was probably probably halfway through that it was starting to change, and I was starting to say, like, hmm, interesting. It was, like, started to be a little, like, twinkle in my eye of, like, could I publish this? What would that look like? And then, of course, it was after, you know, after the hike was over, and I had a few months to maybe, like, decompress for a second was when I kind of made the final call to just say, like, you know what? Let's let's do this. Let's do this thing. Kind of go after go after it. So it's definitely something that kind of developed over the course of the hike. Were you also writing? Yes. Yep. So I had the sketchbook, and of course, there's some written elements in the sketchbook, and then in the book, um, the kind of like trail log component to it on the side. That was all drawn from trail log that I kept in my phone. It was part of like my nightly um, tent ritual. Is that I would. Um, yeah, tap, tap out what I did that day, um, what I saw, you know, because a lot of the time couldn't totally be captured inside of the sketchbook itself because I didn't want it to be too wordy in there either. And so I kept this very long text document on my phone as well that I was just writing out more of the detailed information. Okay, one, one more. One more. <laughs> Mm -hmm. wherever you are. Yes. So it's not like you're just focused on where you are here now, the people that you're with here now, mm -hmm. but you actually could yeah. be there just the same as if you were in a 
coffee shop. Yeah, exactly. No, and it was actually it was really nice because everybody on trail is worried about um, phone battery. <laughs> Everyone's worried about phone battery, and you're, um, for me, it's like, and, and very similar to other people, is you carry a little charging brick, and so the technology aspect for me was charging my phone, charging my little brick, and then being very careful about not using too much juice, which is very similar to other people. And the, the reason why I mention that is because what would happen is that it, we'd all have enough information that we could make these very detailed plans, but it's not as if at the end of the day at these tent sites and, and shelter sites and things that people are on their phone because everybody is like, you know, too worried about touching their phone too much or turning on their phone too much. And so um, it was kind of this interesting little time travel bit because a lot of the times at night, it's like everybody is just enjoying each other's company and and you know you've also been hiking together all day or all week or for weeks and weeks and so it was like this very comfortable companionable thing at the end of each night where it was very low tech um so that was definitely something that was on my mind a lot of like will i have enough charge because i definitely in bad days audiobooks and music was a lifesaver and i really needed that and really used really used that and so it was a lot of a lot of worrying about it there is um, at, like at access, you know, cell access almost everywhere, um, which is say you could get it every day. Um, it was very challenging for me. I was very sensitive to it because I was always trying to get notes and calls back to New Hampshire to my husband to let him know how the day was going or that I haven't been eaten by a bear or like what my plan is or what have you. And so it was something where always be very sensitive to like, well, I have service at the end of the day or you know, well, I have service in the middle of the day and that's when I can call home and then I won't at the end of the day. So for me, it's something that I was very focused on of like how much cell service there is. And so there was always enough that like pretty much every single day we could talk or I could text or get messages through. Um, but it wasn't like every step along the way, very difficult to sustain phone conversations because it just drops out constantly. So, yeah. Um, Thank you. Okay, I think that's all we have time for. I can answer other questions if you wanna come up here. Thank <laughs> you. Mm -hmm.